Thanks for joining us at the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the imagination of Clive Barker. In episode 360, Ryan and Jose are joined by Ian Swanson to talk Clive Barker art with James Jim K. of Transmission Atelier. Jim worked tirelessly on site scanning the Barker art for the Imaginer series. Because this episode has some visual references to art, it is available on YouTube as well as audio, and you may notice more live and less edited quality. This episode is sponsored by Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination. Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination shop is dedicated to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Up to 50% of his proceeds will support the program where artist Don Bertram's volunteers monthly. Don Bertram is a longtime friend of Clive and celebrates and continues to be inspired by his art. He uses that inspiration to help kids through the Texas Children's Cancer Center, and we couldn't be more thrilled to continue to work with him. There's a news feature video that shows Don working with the kids at Texas Children's Cancer Center and his artwork. Click the side banner at www.clivebarkercast.com to find links to the video and his Etsy shop where you can buy his prints, books, and support this wonderful program. Well, welcome. This is episode episode 360. I can't believe we've had that many episodes already. Episode 360 of the Clive Barker Podcast. Uh, and today we've got, uh, um, I'm Ryan and we've got Jose. Hello. And uh, Ian. Ian Swanson is here. Hello. Welcome, Ian. And uh, and we've got a special guest, James K. Do you go by Hello. Jim? I think a lot of people call you Jim too. Jim is fine. Okay. I All use right, James on official records. Gotcha. Yeah, and um, and for people who don't know, um, Jim K. James K. did the uh, the scanning and the and uh, and all of the digital archiving of the of of the art for Clive Barker's Imaginer series. So that was a huge undertaking, right? Uh, months uh, months spent scanning and color correcting and and with uh, really impressive equipment. And so we kind of want to dig into that a little bit. Sure. Sure. So, so, how, uh, so uh, how did you first uh, meet Clive? You know, I uh, I first met Clive in Chicago. I believe it was 2008. I believe it was the winter of 2008. I had just kind of started Transmission Atelier as a side project, and I was I was making prints of darker art. Um, scarier stuff, and uh, somebody by the who, who went by the name Rusty Nails invited <laughs> me to uh, to have a booth at a at a horror movie conference where where Clive was the MC, and it, and that conference was all about the release, I believe, of Midnight Meat Train. And it was in Chicago at the Music Box Theater, and then uh, I got invited to Packer Shop Gallery in Chicago, where Clive was also doing an opening, and that's where I got to meet him for the first time. So that, that was uh, quite a few years then before uh, before you started working on the Imaginer project. You know, it it was uh, it really it was it was kind of a strange set of events that happened. I mean, I, I I had started Transmission Atelier as just a hobby, as just a a creative outlet because I was working in advertising, I was getting kind of burnt out, and I was just kind of doing kind of following my bliss, and it led me to this to this horror conference where I was a vendor, and it led me to meet Clive. And then it led me to, to, to make my initial discovery as into Clive as a, as a painter. And then he and I had a conversation and I had just started this, this, this digitization business, this, this publishing entity. And I asked him if I could um, do some test scans and some of his paintings that were there at the gallery. And he said, sure. And uh, Aaron Packer agreed. And I, I set up uh, the scanning camera on site there and I, I took a couple of, of test scans of Clive's paintings and made some prints and, and, and sent him a, a package of some test materials and uh, I didn't hear anything back for a long 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 time and then I believe it was four or five or six years later I got contacted to 
to, to work with him on, on the Imaginer project. So it was, it was a very, it was almost like a seed was planted and then it didn't start to gestate for about another five years. <laughs> I think I remember reading around the time, 2008, um, I used to follow this magazine called Boing Boing on the internet, and they made an article about your, at the time, you were publishing uh, uh, 18th and 19th century uh, medical illustrations with, you know, like the the double-skulled uh, fetus skeleton and stuff like that. So uh, I guess I guess you were doing that stuff at the time, huh? I forgot about that. Yeah, um, that's right around the time I, I started the project, I, you know, Transmission Atelier, I call it a project, you know, it, it's, it's, it's varied in, in form over the years. It's been a, it was, it, it was a, it was a small business. So it was an escort for a while and then it was a project and then it was a hobby and it's just fluctuated in, in form and definition, but that's, that's how I started it. The intent was to, to, to really get into publishing, let's say questionable subject matter and, and visual art for, for those with some darker tastes. And uh, that's really kind of how I intended to start it. Um, so yeah, that's, that was the material that I brought to this, to this horror movie conference in Chicago. And that's, that's uh, the vehicle to which I met Clive, which is, a, which is a, an appropriate uh, trajectory. Sure, so you started Transmission Atelier around April of 2008, right? Yep, if memory yeah. serves, yep. You got some cool artwork behind you uh, right there. I see uh, you mentioned some questionable uh, uh, subject matter. I see like an anti-clerical poster right there next to you. Uh, is that like uh, La Lanterne, Republican Journal, anti-clerical? That's a really amazing, impressive thing. Is that like a, a real one or a print? That is a print that I made. I used to own the original. Um, original posters are sometimes fragile and and difficult to own. So I, I was buying them just to scan them and, and, and make prints of them. And then I would sell the originals. So that's an original I did have. It's one of my favorites because um, an artist that I, that I really like, Philip Droulet, he's a French artist. He was one of the co-founders of Heavy Metal Magazine. And I saw a picture of him in the 70s or something with this poster hanging in his studio. And I just thought it was so cool that I had to have it. It definitely is. It says, here's the enemy. And it's pointing right to the... Uh, Sacre Coeur Church in Paris, right? So yep. Basically calling the Catholic Church the enemy. That's, yeah, uh, it's pretty, uh, it kind of, uh, you know, pulls no punches, you know, yeah. it leaves you without, without questioning about who they're talking about. Yeah, and absolutely. It's, and it's pretty sinister for, for the early uh, 20th century, you know? Yeah. So um, that's interesting that you got to meet Clive that early in the, uh, back in 2008. And uh so in 2014, um, when you started your work in Imaginer, uh, what was it like to walk into the studio for the first time and just take a look at all those paintings? It's kind of a monolithic body of work. The first time I walked into his studio, yeah. Um, it was uh, pretty intense, actually. Um, Clive... Uh, at the time had, had two homes right next to each other in Beverly Hills. And, and the home that I first went into was, used to be, it was sort of his offices and, uh, and, and it was his primary art studio and, and creative studio. And I um, showed up there and uh, I believe it was Mark Miller who, who met me and, and, uh, and let me into the house and did a quick tour of the upstairs. And then uh, he opened a door that led the, to this to this um, set of stairs that was about five flights of stairs down into this into the studio space that had like 25 foot tall ceilings. And uh, I remember walking down the stairs and uh, you're gonna think I'm weird, but I remember walking down that stairway and, and being hit immediately with a physical sensation of dread. Uh -huh. oh. And and it was it was really weird. Um, I and I I commented to, to Mark at the time, and and uh, I go, I go, I feel a, a a physical sensation of dread walking into this room, and 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 Mark turned to his associate and said, he something to the effect of, of everybody has that experience when they go go into that room, like like mm -hmm. not one person has not made that comment. Yeah. In a in a personal context, I mean. Uh... Ryan and I, we've been there. We checked out the studio. I think we, you were there uh, scanning Matter Motley uh, on the day that we got to visit the studio. Yeah. And, I remember that. 
Yeah, yeah, it was a great day. It was the day they were, you know, doing the screening of the Nightbreed Director's Cut and the Crest at uh, Westwood. And that was, I immediately got hit with that sensation as well. It was almost like a when I could smell this weird paint smell and all that, you know. And then once you start going down the stairs, it's like, this is it. I'm crossing over the mirror here. It's, it's, I'm stepping into the mirror, into another world. And all those paintings were just stacked around and, and well, just, you know, with those dark uh, blackout curtains that you had on. Um, so you could have, you know, control the lighting on the scans. We're, we're, we're kind of stepping on, uh, we've got a question from one of our listeners, Maz mm -hmm. Watkins, and we're kind of stepping on her question, but she says, sure. a massive thank you for what, uh, what was beautifully achieved. Our one question, how overwhelming was it to be in such a vast amount of work? Uh, the weight alone of Clive's art and passion in every, uh, in every piece continually astounds me to see it in person. Total. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So right. it was it was determined in that first meeting at Seraphim that the scope of work involved really required that that I bring and, and set up a digital imaging lab on site at, in in Clive's studio house, and that's it, that was determined right away. Just the the, the volume of, of work that was in that house, um, the amount of time that would be required to digitize everything, required that I set up the imaging lab on site. And it also kind of required that I live there because it revealed itself that this was going to be long hours. I was going to have to, to keep a, a day and night schedule in order to keep up. And that, that meant that I would have to turn Clive's painting studio into my living and working space, which mm -hmm. I did. So I, I found myself living and working in Clive's studio at the Seraphim house. And I was uh, surrounded day and night, 24 seven with roughly a thousand, 1200 of Clive's paintings, plus other untold amounts of, of drawings and, and works on paper. And I was surrounded with this material and very quickly, um, I just started, I, I started to become really immersed in it because if, if you see a Clive Barker painting in person, it's, it's incredibly captivating. Mm -hmm. um, it's it, it really as you guys know it, it these are visceral works and they there there's almost a visceral and physical presence to them yeah and a, a topography right in the impasto that he uses the technique it's uh it kind of almost reaches out to you through the canvas in some in some cases it does and i uh i'm a big fan of of sci-fi art and uh, uh you know my main influence is, is basically heavy metal magazine from the late seventies, early eighties. And I love fantasy art and, and, and figurative work like, like Clive was doing. And I just got completely sucked in. I, I just uh, found myself surrounded by this work. And it was a, uh, it was almost a spiritual experience really to be, to be staring at this material day and night and living with it. So you started working in, in printing pretty early, right? Like in the late 80s, uh, I believe. Yes, I, uh, I've been in the printing business for, I think, going on 38 years. I started, it was a family business. I'm the third generation of my family to be in the print, commercial printing industry. And I got trained into it really young, you know, sort of apprenticing uh, at night and during the summer for my, for my uncle who had a... Uh, a high-end uh, color trade shop. That's what they called mm -hmm. them back in the day. And I did a, uh, a couple of formal apprenticeships with the, with the graphic arts union in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, I was a member, I'm also a typographer. I'm a member of the now defunct uh, Chicago typographical union as well in Chicago, which is the first union in Chicago. Huh. And my entire yeah. background is in commercial print, which I'm still doing it today. <laughs> That's that's wonderful. Um, because I'm I'm not gonna lie, I found your LinkedIn, and that's why I'm getting access to all the things that you've done over the, the years. And it's a pretty impressive uh, it's a pretty impressive resume. Um, going back to the Imaginer books, and I'm gonna pull out the first book right here, uh, Imaginer, Volume One, which became kind of a community effort of you know the fans and on on crowdfunding to have this. Uh, started and 
I mean, I've had some art books over the years. I've, I've, I've seen books like for Morpheus International. I've seen books from Phaedon. And the, the, the quality of, of this book is matches that one in every sense, um, including, because if you're a Clive Barker fan, we've had art books from Clive in the past, but they were not exactly um, professional art books. I mean, and the only one that tried to be a professional art book uh, failed kind of spectacularly. It never even got put on sale, which was uh, um, that- oh, I think it yeah, it, it was put on sale. The, was you're it put on sale? About Visions of Heaven and Hell. Yeah, but I mean, we all bought it. Yeah, but then it just ended up, you know, uh, uh, most of the edition ended up being uh, remanded. Correct. I mean, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. I, I I've seen it in Barnes and Noble and stuff. I mean, in the past when it yeah. came out, not not now. You can't find it. Sure, now, but. sure. But so. Um, you said, uh, so for the first and second one, you weren't living at Clive's studio yet, right? That started around the third volume? It started around the second volume. So the volume one, I was essentially commuting um, from mm -hmm. Chicago to Los Angeles to, to work on this. Um, I still had a day job. I was working for a, uh, I was working for a, a systems integrator company implementing, um, digital asset management and workflow automation technology for the advertising industry space. And I was, uh, I was working on Imaginer in my free time and I was commuting back and forth. You know, I would, I would go to LA to, to scan as many paintings as I could and then go back to Chicago where I would uh, be working on the layout for the book. So it was a, it was, that was a commute. So volumes one and partially volume two was, I had not yet set up shop full time yet. Mm. That is amazing. So uh, the first thing that we can read here in the volume, it says the images in this book were newly captured using a high resolution scan back camera with a rodent stock lens and a digital focusing system to make sure that we have the crispest possible detail. The artworks were then painstakingly color corrected to make certain that viewing the artworks in this book are as close as possible to the actual physical experience. Could you um, explain a little bit about the technique that went into that? Like, uh, what so to photograph a particular painting how many times would you average to have to take a photo to get a properly focused uh, photo of the painting so you can then color correct it so that system that's described in the book um you know technology advances really really fast and you know to, to talk about this system now it's it's a little less impressive than it was, but it was it was still a, a very very specialized method where I had a four by five studio camera that had a scanner on the back of it, and and it was it wasn't a shutter based photographic system. It, it was a it was a scan. Mm -hmm. It was a trilinear scanner. It would scan in RGB, and this method allowed a digital image that was you know two and a half to three times the effective resolution of like a DSLR camera. Wow, um, and 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 the lens meant that we can get the camera really really close to the painting, and capture almost microscopic detail. And um, it was uh, it was a very manual process. You know, it was actually intentionally manual. We wanted to we wanted to create an experience with these books that was that modeled the the experience of being in the same room with these paintings, mm. and these captures were kind of a key ingredient to that. So. It was very manual. It was very, very time consuming. Um, it, it was not efficient production, um, but we didn't care because it, it, it yielded the, the highest quality output. And at first, while I was getting used to Clive's studio space and um, the lighting conditions in there and, and getting adjusted and calibrated, I would take sometimes three or four captures and, mm -hmm. and I would have to kind of focus and then refocus again. Um, to make sure that I was getting the uh, the sharpest picture possible, and then I would take multiple captures, and and then I would spend a lot of time um, doing manual color correction, um, just to just to make sure that the image on the screen and on the printed page, you know, matched these same colors as you would see when you're looking at the real painting, which is something that really bothers me with with art publications. You know, if if I buy an art book chances are I'm going to be looking at a painting in this art book and I'll, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person who will then go to the museum where they have the original and I will compare 
And oh, right. so, so often, <laughs> you know, the, the, the reproduction in, in the art book um, looks nothing like the original painting. And I just wanted to, I had a chance to really kind of remedy that with this publication. The images are extremely crisp and uh, there are some very impressive uh, double page spreads of like details. Uh, like for yeah, example, yeah. you know, the like for example, detail. this one with the Terry cats, which is obviously a small detail of a larger painting where you can see like each scratch and even the, the texture of the, the canvas, like the parts where the paint failed to adhere to the canvas and left behind a little dot. And uh, it's just so impressive. It's really, I think that once you look at the eight volumes of Imaginer, it's the closest anyone can get to getting that feeling of going down the steps to the studio and uh, oh experiencing, uh, you know, I, what it's like to, to see Clive's studio. My first experience was sitting in the waiting room, you know, while Rob Humphreys was taking care of some business and phone calls and stuff. And, and uh, Princess Breath was like right behind me. I was on the couch, you know, I was sitting on the couch and Princess Breath was right there. And I'd looked at it and I'm like, I have to touch this. And so I had to feel the, feel the, the, um, the paint, you know, it, it, it's so it, it's not, it's not flat. Like it looks in the, in the old art books. It's, it's sure. uh like like Jose was saying, it it really, it's really got a kind of a type a uh, 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 topography. It it does. They a lot of these paintings are you know actually three dimensional, and we we wanted to make sure we captured that too. And I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, that was the intent was to really replicate as close as possible the physical experience of seeing these these objects in person. Um, so it's nice to hear that we succeeded. I was muted. Um, absolutely, one hundred percent. So, uh, and how long were you uh, scanning these images for? Because the books came out over a certain number of years, but how much time was it to scan all the images that we see uh, in the Imaginer, more or less? Oh, uh, so let me think. Because I, I believe I started in two thousand fourteen, and that was that was commuting back and forth from Chicago to Los Angeles. And um, I had, uh, I had to, uh, I had to turn over the, uh, the digital capturing duties to another photographer named Mir. Mm -hmm. So all told the digitization process took close to five years. Wow. wow. Yeah. Close to five years. And, and those were just captures that were done on site, direct digital captures, where we had the original painting or drawing in front of us. There's also a, a substantial body of Clive's work that we didn't have the originals for. And we had to, luckily we had um, three ring binders full of four by five transparencies that I think Clive had had made years prior. Oh. I think this was before digital photography mm. was, was a viable technical solution for capturing artwork. He had to use, um, film cameras, he had to use a four by five uh, film camera. And, and I found on site there, uh, several three ring binders full of these four by five transparencies. So I spent um, a long time capturing those on a, on a high end graphic arts scanner. Wow. So about five years, give or take. So that yeah, would have been, when, when you were commuting from Chicago, that would have been around the time that Jose and I visited, because I think we were there October of 2014 was when we came to visit for the the Nightbreed uh, director's cut premiere. Yeah, I think that was it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was that was definitely it. So um, it's interesting because we see another book that has really good uh, scans of Clive Barker's paintings are, of course, the Aberrant volumes. Um, so do you have any information about who scanned them and how they did that? Or was that something not brought up while you were there? You know, I, I don't know who, so, so the, the, uh, the illustrations that are, that are reproduced and printed in the original editions of, of, uh, of Aberat, uh, those were in fact made from these same four by five transparencies. Oh, oh I see. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know who the photographer was. I, I was never able to find out. Um, but I do know that the, uh, the pre-press entity and the commercial printer, they did, they did work from 
um, scans of those of those four by five transparencies. And I I stared at those pages for a long time, you know, the pages of Aberat, and um, I was uh, I saw room for improvement um, relative to color communication. Sure, um, sure. When you have a chance to actually be in the same room as the paintings and and look back and forward, I'm sure there'll be things that jump out at you, especially when you have a trained eye. I got a picture right here from volume one, which it's you. Oh, yeah. Let's see if I can focus that on you. There you are. Oh, yeah. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I remember that. Yep. This one. Uh, very impressive, you know, uh, blood red and blue background. Uh, wonderful. Um, yeah, so you were in the studio with this one. Let me, let me take a look here. So, because uh, I have my imaginer. Yeah, that was page 36 of uh, 36. Imaginer 1. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So that was uh, this was still in the in the times where I was commuting. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't fully uh, set up a complete studio in Clive's in Clive's space yet, and uh, yeah, I was. Um, so the paintings are starting to surround me, as you can see. Uh -huh. um, next to me is uh, one of my favorites, which is which is called Death's Womb. Um, very very quintessential horror painting. I mean, that painting is terrifying. Um, it, it, it's, it has a, vis, it has a, vis, a visceral effect when you, when you look at that painting. And then there's another one too called, uh, called The Itch, which I believe was a version of Mater Motley, mm -hmm. um, which I don't, know, I don't know if it was finished or not, um, but that was also a favorite just because I love the violet background color um, in contrasting with the red hair. And then of course, behind me is, a, uh, is some sort of a, uh, a terrible creature, you know, some sort of a demon. So that was kind of me uh, building my dream office in Clive Barker's uh, basement. <laughs> that is fantastic. Uh, you know, interesting. On, on page thirty-two, mm -hmm. that's actually the first scan that I took of the first painting. Oh, I see. So the one with the uh, the stitch links, the 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 creatures, uh, the multitude of creatures, right? Yeah, I remember that day. So. Outside of that room there, there was a there was a storage area, which when I say a storage area, it was almost an 800 square foot space, you know, bigger than some apartments I've had. That yeah. was there was a two story space that was devoted to storing Clive's paintings. And mm. I had first walked in there and, and there I saw, you know, a thousand or eleven hundred. Forty by 60 inch canvases, um, completed paintings, and that painting there, that stitchling was kind of propped up against the wall and uh it was the very first painting that i saw and it sort of slapped me in the face you know the intensity of it and i i am like this is the first one i'm going to start with so that was the beginning of the of the process actually yeah with this this uh lizard looking monster and uh that multitude of stitchlings that's over there so these were some of the first so these were the first that you uh scanned yep yep it looks like there's a, a mirror hanging from one of the paintings during the scanning process. Is that a mirror? Yes, it is. So part of the, uh, the digitization process and, and the camera system I was using, it allowed a mechanism to achieve what's called parallelism. Um, when you try to photograph a flat piece of artwork, it's really, really difficult to, to sometimes to, to get the, the painting completely parallel with your film back or your digital back. Mm -hmm. And I had a mirror system that allowed me to adjust the tilts and swings of the camera to get it precisely parallel with the painting. So there'd be no, no trapezoiding when I take the shot. There'd be no need to, to distort the painting in Photoshop. It, it would be a pure one-to-one -one digital capture. You know, again, it was totally overkill. Um, but it, uh, it was another step in the process. I had to, I had to dial in every photograph, I had to focus the camera and, and get the alignment and the parallelism straight and, and the exposure. And so it was very, very tedious and, uh, and wonderfully complicated. Oh, sure, I, I can imagine that. Uh, yeah, uh, fantastic stuff. I mean, every time I look at these books and my shelf, I still can't believe that the entire series of eight books was, was put out. Uh, 
as long as it took, but at the same time, it kind of just, once it got into Phil and Sarah Stokes and the Clyde Barker archives hands, it really started picking up speed and they just started coming out, you know, one after the other. It was like some years, there was like one coming out and a few months later, there was another coming out. And it was so exciting to, to finally get the eighth volume and, and be able to say, well, I, I got them all. So, you know, it, uh, I'm sure there must have been, do you estimate that there were uh, many p scans that didn't end making the cut? There was quite a few, yes. Mm -hmm. um, because in, in parallel with, with making these captures for use in the Imaginer series, um, I was essentially building a, uh, a digital asset collection of, of this body of work. And um, the intent was always to, to use that collection for other channels. Um, we were using the images for an iteration of Clive's retail website, um, various other publishing projects, uh, marketing advertising images. So these captures, um, you know, had multi multi channels where they where they went, and there is there's uh, there's quite a few that were sort of in the unpublished um, category. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember a particular one that that strikes me uh, that I was shown by Mark Miller at the time. It was an academy by Clive Barker, and it was made in pastel on brown paper. It was a man with a, a bright colored suit, and uh, it was such a, a striking uh, figurative piece of art. Uh, apparently, it was from Clive when he was, you know, a young man that he 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 made that with pastels, and I I just. Do you remember scanning that one at all? Or do you know if that was preserved? I'm sure it must have been at some point if it was like one of Clive's earlier works. You know, I, uh, I don't remember that one specifically, not to say that I didn't end up scanning it. Um, yeah. Because in fact, I, I was fortunate enough to, to have some of Clive's really, really, really early works like from the 70s that, that I was able to scan on the flatbed scanner. Um, mm -hmm. I'll have to look and see if that one exists in there. Sure, sure. Um, that the amount of doodles that he has is just insane. I mean, the, you know, every time they made, yeah, even paintings. I mean, it just my the first tour I had of that studio house, we went into the backyard and there was a tent set up, and it was all just paintings that that Clive rejected, and so they all just get a tent outside, and those to me those were awesome, you know. And it's like, oh, they, these are the garbage ones, you know. Yeah. <laughs> There was a, there was quite a few. I, I kind of learned how to read Clive's paintings, and I began. It wasn't, it wasn't easy, but I, I began to be able to, to kind of tell. Oh, this, this one's unfinished, or, or this one. He, it looks like he just couldn't get it to execute the way he wanted it to. There, there was a few of those, and I, it was fun to be able to immerse myself in his, in his sort of language of painting to be able to, to determine what was a finished work and what wasn't. And you know, one, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that. You know what? What what really was uh, was a stunt was most astonishing about the scope of this project was the amount of work, the amount of paintings and drawings and works on paper and pastels and pen and ink. The, the sheer amount of artwork hmm. that was in this space was really really hard to comprehend, and especially the number of very very large canvases these these forty by sixty canvases that were as far as I understand, entirely intended for, for the Aberat series. It was just really hard to, to wrap my head around how any, any one person could, could create, could output <laughs> that many paintings. Yeah. And I still don't understand how it happened. Yeah. Um, I, have, I have some theories, but it was really, really quite astonishing to see the volume of work that, that was inside Clive's space. Sure. I remember yeah. that complex system of racks and stuff that they had to to be able to sort through them and find them. I, I wore the, the, I had the Dragon Man t-shirt and I, and I said, this was to Ben Mears, I think I said, hey, would you be able to find this painting so I could take a picture with it? Cause I was wearing the t-shirt and it took like, a, you know, 15 minutes of, of sorting through wow. all the, I felt kind of bad asking for that after that, but it took a long time for him to find that one to pull it out so that we could do that photo. Yeah, yeah. One of the important things about Imaginer mm -hmm. is that for people who didn't know that Clyde Barker was such a prolific artist, it really brought to the forefront um, 
I mean, for some people, like we have a, a, a friend of ours who's also a collaborator, Marcus Williams. He actually got into Clyde Barker because of the paintings, and 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 then he he started reading all this stuff, and 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 also began painting and writing his own work. But um, some people just a lot of people just knew Clyde from the books, and uh, they didn't even have any idea that he was a, a, an artist. Um, Hellraiser. Yeah, I was lucky that you know started out with with uh, some pretty cool books that he put out. Some of them had his own you know, black and white ink art. And uh, so I, from the beginning, I realized that, oh, he's a guy who can do anything. He can write, he can paint, he can draw, he can do theater, um, you know, and, and Imaginer really brings that to the forefront. It really is an amazing uh, legacy for, for the Clyde, Clyde Barker's body of work to have this series of Imaginer books that you help to, to develop. And, uh, and of course, the the printer is important too, right? It was a GPSD. Yeah, um, we couldn't have done. You know, this this project literally would not have happened without um, Phil and Sarah, obviously, um, right. as the publisher for for Clive Barker Imaginer. Um, you know, it literally would not have been done without them, literally. And um, they were such um, tremendously wonderful. Um, publishers and people to work with on this. And uh, yeah, we, another important part of this too is, is the printer we used. Um, Stephen Joff at Global PSD was also a, a key, a key partner um, in this as well. And you, you mentioned about, you know, the multi-talents of, of Clive, you know, when I, when I started this project or when I met Clive in, in 2008, you know, I'm going to out myself as, as probably the worst Clive Barker fan, but I, I knew him as, I knew him from Hellraiser. And, and I knew him as a painter. Um, I had no idea that he was an author. <laughs> I had no idea. I had no insight into his other um, work in cinema whatsoever. I had no right. idea. You know, Hellraiser came out when I was in high school. I think I was a junior in high school. And I'll never forget seeing the original trailer in 1984 or whenever that was. And it, it literally permanently etched itself into my mind, <laughs> the Hellraiser trailer. And, yeah. and, that, and when I first saw the... the <laughs> What's that? Satan's done waiting. That was the yeah, original tagline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I when I first and when when the when the posters for Hellraiser started popping up in my town, um, a suburb outside of Chicago, I mean, it was I had never seen anything like that before, and and it was it was it was it was really taking horror to the next level back then, in in the mid '80s, and Clive like sort of became the king of horror, and that's how I knew him from, and I knew him as a mm -hmm. painter, and. Uh, so I, um, my approach to this is, is kind of reverse. It's, it's the reverse path of, of a typical Clive Barker fan. Um, yeah. Then when I, was, when I was working on Imaginer and I was living you know, at Seraphim, that's kind of when I learned about his other disciplines. And that's kind of when I learned about his writing and uh, his other film work and things. So I've got a lot of catching up to do to, to call myself a, a legitimate Clive fan, but uh, I know him as Hellraiser. And, and through his artwork primarily. Um, I, that's really how I know him today as a painter. I know him as a painter and an illustrator primarily. It's a, it's a fun technology. I was able to, uh, to visit Mainz in Germany, uh, the city where Gutenberg was born and the printing press was developed. And uh, it, it kind of hits you a little bit like to understand that before that was developed, that books were handwritten uh, and hand decorated and hand painted. And then one day someone, you know, it might have developed per, in a parallel between Asia and, and Germany. But, you know, when someone decided that, hey, we can just, you know, make little blocks of stuff and block printing, we can make books, you know, and spread them out, you know, multiple copies in, in a short amount of time. And so that was such a revolutionary technique uh, to this day. And it's a technique that I think... The digital world is is very interesting, and you can definitely fit an entire library on your phone. But if something happens that that particular storage gets damaged, then you've lost it all. And and with a book, even though paper has a, a limited shelf life, um, you know, I, I collected and sold old books for a while, books that went back to you know the 18th century and stuff. And I always got amazed at the almost the 
the the care that they would do for older you know hardcovers and uh the way they would decorate it with like you know uh parchment you know uh, parchment pages and you know gold uh inlaid work in the covers leather that was like to this day certain leather covers that still keep that shape that was worked into that um and it's still amazing to pick up an old book and and feel the connection to that craft uh in terms of printing um and i guess when you when you start thinking about art printing uh art reproductions um then it becomes a different beast, but also has that same issue with like, you know, multiplying the same piece of work and reproductions. And I know that, for example, in art reproductions, the the thing is to make them as similar as possible. But I I had some you know small printers uh, printing out you know uh, booklets and and chapbooks and 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 sometimes. But the fun of that material sometimes in printing text is the discrepancies from one page to the other sometimes. And uh, I don't know if that's something you experienced when when you were doing early printing work, but I just thought it was something I would like to share. Oh, that's an interesting topic. Um, it reminds me that one of my uh, one of my one of the one of the best parts about collaborating with Clive on Imaginer is his um, deep familiarity with the publishing process and the printing process, because obviously he he's he's an author. And he's an illustrator, and he has a, a a lot of experience as a commercial illustrator. And it was really, and he, and he has a he has a lot of experience with sort of the, the pre desktop publishing era of of print and publishing, which I do as well. And Clive really understands um, that process, and it was really really so refreshing to to take proofs over to Clive and to show him proofs and to have him really understand. Um, what what good color was versus bad color uh, mm -hmm. of when we're matching something and when we're not matching something. And he understood, you know, page composition and he understood, you know, page layout and all of the traditional print publishing um, aspects, you know, Clive totally understood them because that's where he came from. He has a, uh, he has a long history in, in, in the pre desktop publishing um, world as, as do I. And I thought that was just so, wonderful to, to be able to collaborate with him uh, on that level with around some of this conventional knowledge. Because, you know, everybody today, you know, everybody's a photographer, everybody's a graphic designer, um, every, and everybody's a publisher. And not everyone is, is skilled and trained in those disciplines. And this whole process was, it allowed us to, to really elevate these disciplines and, and make a superior quality product. And I love that Clive was, uh, he was um, right there. He was right there for it all um, and kept up with it, with it all and understood what good quality was and bad quality. Of course. And I also like to collect old uh, magazines <clears throat> and I have a few, you know, 1910, 1920 magazines from France and illustrated illustration magazines that would have like those elaborate woodcuts that, you can't imagine how long it took for them to scrape all that stuff on a plate and then to print that. And, and then you flip the page. And nowadays, of course, pages are full of like ads that are made out of, you know, photographs. But back then, most of the ads were drawn by artists. They had typography, they had uh, uh, design, they had, you know, they would paint, um, you know, it's, it's just an incredible amount of work that they would do uh, before photography became like, the standard for advertising. Uh, everything was drawn. They would draw a lady, you know, putting her little, you know, perfume around her neck and stuff. And the, there would be like the wonderful, like uh, brand logo and stuff. It was all, uh, it's a definitely a, a fantastic art that, uh, that now it's just replaced by photography, which is also nice, but, uh, but that seems like that craft in, in printing has gotten a little lost. It has. It has. Um, there is, with some exceptions, though, there, there's some revival. You know, we, we live in a we live in a time when, um, as these you know, sort of popular commercial processes get automated and 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 digitized and 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 really simplified, there there then becomes sort of a uh, a response, which is to revive some of the boutique methods. You know, an example of this is you know vinyl records versus digital recordings. Um, and there's all kinds of examples um, 
you know, the whole analog versus digital argument. Actually, it's funny that you bring that up. I just bought today a vinyl that I'm just going to bring over to the camera. So here is this amazing cover. And I hope you guys can see it's Star Castle. And this album is, is a kind of a prog rock album, but this is like a painting by Hildebrandt, by one of the Hildebrandt brothers. And it's just, when you look at this, I mean, it's an amazing cover. It's just, it, I have no idea how long it took to make this cover, but uh, it's not something that you want reproduced on a CD size cover. You want to see this in like, a good size, decent quality, um, you know, format. Right. Yeah. You know, I remember, you know, I remember my, my earliest exposure to, to sort of Clive Barker adjacent material was, um, you know, I got a hold of uh, one of my friend's older brother's uh, heavy metals. We had a, there was a stack of heavy metal magazines from 1977 to 1980. And I got a hold of these magazines when I was like, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old. And um, it, it really kind of rewired my brain <laughs> quite a bit. And uh, I'll never forget, you know, looking at the, some of the pages of this artwork and being like, whoa, I've never seen anything like that before. And then from there, I, I tracked down some of these Frank Frazetta posters, which I think every kid who grew up in the 70s had these three Frazetta posters. And I don't remember the names of the paintings, but everybody had them. And mm -hmm. I had these things forever. I think I might still have one of them around somewhere. And, you know, <laughs> I remember, I remember going to San Diego Comic-Con one year and I actually met the original publisher of those Frazetta posters. And he still had stacks of them from the original wow. print one done in 1978. Original stock. That's amazing. Like, he really, he still, he still had original stock. And wow being in the printing business, I, I kind of understand because back in the seventies, there was no easy way to reproduce um, uh, an oil painting onto a poster. It, it wasn't very cost-effective. And in order to make it really work and to make it cost-effective, you had to print tens of thousands of copies, if not hundreds of thousands. And when I, when I saw this, these posters left over from the seventies, I'm like, oh, that's what this was. This was they had to print so many to make it to make it cost effective that there's still some left. That's pretty amazing um, how that stuff ends up in a warehouse and uh, people kind of forget about that until it shows up in a convention or, a, you know, a market somewhere. It's yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so what is one of the can you do you have any favorite uh, paintings that come to mind that you worked on for Imaginer? Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Absolutely. There, there's too many to remember. Mm -hmm. um, but I think probably, you know, my, my, what will be my, my favorite Clive Barker painting, I think, would be Mr. Christopher Carrion. Mm. Um, hands down. I mean, there are other yeah. ones too. But but I think this is my ultimate favorite. Um, this really checks off all the boxes for me. It's 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 this sort of fantasy horror figurative painting, mm -hmm. um, you know, right in right in that in that in that fantasy art genre that, that heavy metal used to capture so well in the seventies and eighties, and the backstory of this character. I, yeah. I I didn't know the backstory of Christopher Carrion until I started working at Seraphim. And you know the the backstory is absolutely terrifying, and mm -hmm. and and he is a he is a character in a children's book. Yeah, <laughs> it got dark. It, yeah, yeah, he's, and, uh, he's terrifying and tragic at the same time. Terrifying and tragic at the same time. I mean, his yeah. his lips were sewn shut by his mother for uttering the word love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Am I remembering this correctly? And then it his, is. his gra know, grandmother. His grandmother, right? His grandmother. Yeah. So sorry. See, I'm not. I'm not the greatest Clive fan. I, sh I should have my my information more perfect. I apologize. But um, you know, once once I was able to connect that backstory, you know, the character's mythology with the original painting that was that I would look at every day of my career for a while. 
it really had an effect on me. And this is probably my favorite of all time. Hands and down. It, even though Clive has done a lot of three quarter portraits of characters, I mean, that one actually looks deliberately like a portrait that would be hanging on the wall of the palace in, you know, at the Island of Midnight. It definitely looks like a portrait, like, yeah, that was painted with him sitting for it and everything like that. So it's just, uh, it really conveys that villainous portrait kind of uh, nature to it. Absolutely. You know, and, and you know, relative to, to the story about the Carrion painting, um, <clears throat> you know, this one here of Casper Wolfswinkel, um, oh, yeah. I did learn that this was the origin painting of the mm -hmm. entire body of work. Mm -hmm. um, that that was the, the very first, that was the inaugural painting that, that kind of gave birth to the entire visual body and, and to the entire Aberat universe. Um, right. At the time, it was still just an idea. It was going to be called the Book of Hours. And then it started evolving from that. And it kind of just took Clive and he just ran with it, you know, painting and smoking cigars throughout the night and just uh, became a huge thing. And it, it kind of felt like the paintings kind of drew, drew him into the story rather than the story providing him with the paintings. It's it kind of went the other way around. So that's that's yeah. a fascinating process. And since you opened the door to favorite paintings, um, we may have to spend a few moments. Um, this is another one. Um, it's called The Surgeon. Mm -hmm. And I don't, uh, I don't know the backstory of this character. I don't know if there is one. Um, do you guys know? Is this, is this no, an aberrant? No, no idea. No idea. Yeah. That has not shown up in the books yet, but uh, I can definitely see that when you attach a name to a painting, it kind of, your brain starts racing to try to make sense of why it's called that. Yeah. And then you start thinking about what's that in the back? Is that a giant tumor? Is he a surgeon? He's got the white, you know, uh, scrubs on and the mask. And it's like, okay, now I see the surgeon part. Yeah. And, and he just try to imagine what kind of creature did he operate on? And it's just, yeah. that that's what this book really makes my brain race because it, I look at a, a painting. You know? Yeah. And it's like, yeah. you look at a painting and you're like, okay, without knowing the title, I'm going to try to find out what this is. And then you look at the title and it's like, oh, now I got a completely different idea of how to look at the painting. It's amazing how that will change uh, your entire interpretation. You know, these, you nailed it. The, these paintings, you know, what was so different about this, this body of work is that they were visceral. I mean, to, to look at them was to be absorbed by them. And to look at them was an emotional experience. Um, to be in that studio was an emotional experience. I, I can't tell you how many times people came over for meetings or for tours and, you know, a high number of these people that came in would burst into tears when they entered the yeah. studio. And they would burst into tears when they would get a good look at some of these paintings. And it wasn't because they were horrified or, or scared by Clive Barker. It was because there was some really powerful emotional reaction going on, which I can really yeah. attest to. Mm -hmm. um, this is another personal favorite. It's called Crab King. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it's just, you know, I, I, for one, I, I love the color palette on here. It's, it's a color palette that I would never um, come up with without, uh, you know, but the fact that he came up with, so Clive is a color expert. Clive loves and understands color and how to use color. And this is an example of that. There's and, a lot of yellows and greens and ochres in there. Yeah, and and this this fluorescent sort of cadmium red that's in there too. And on top, on top, this is a very this is an absolutely terrifying creature. <laughs> it's absolutely yeah. terrifying. And so that 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 checks off all the boxes for me as well. Yeah, I love it. That the thing at the top of his head might not just be a crown for the king, but also legs that, you know, it, yeah. it, it's just amazing. You just you actually start animating these characters in your mind and you just you know, go off and it's, it's incredible. Very visual experience. You know, there's, there's another one I, I want to try to find quickly um, that, uh, that, that really registers as a favor too, for, for different reasons. So this one on page 483 of, of volume three, mm -hmm. this is called Inferno. And this is a personal favorite of mine for different reasons. This was, this was the painting that I, test scanned in Chicago. Um, it was hanging in, in at, at Packer Shop Gallery in Chicago uh, during that exhibition of Clyde's that he did when he was in town uh, promoting Midnight Meat Train and when I first met him. This was the painting that I tested on. And um, the original I think sold a long time ago. I don't know who owns it today, but um, 
I found myself with an opportunity to include this painting in Imagine. And it was really fun to, uh, you know, I'm kind of obsessive and it was fun to, to resurrect the original file that I did in 2008, oh, yeah. you know, many, many years later to use in this publication. Um, and, and to have the painting long gone, you know, the painting was, was long sold and, but just to be able to include it. And, you know, this also, this painting, see, one of the things I love about Clive's paintings is they can connect to any number of emotional states. Um, and the, the, the Inferno painting, you know, it's, it's this church burning to the ground. Um, I don't know if it was an, is an aberrant or not. I, I love to make up my own stories for Clive's paintings, but, you know, it's 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 this church that was in flames and it was it was collapsing um, and being permanently destroyed and and the flames are very pronounced and it looks really really hot and and I love the background, you know, greenish blue color and it looks like it's just utter destruction. Uh, destruction of what? Destruction of innocence. Right. Destruction of spiritual values. Um, destruction of of holiness and pureness. And mm -hmm. this painting was kind of apropos at that time in my life when I first saw it. So it's another favorite for, for those reasons. So, I mean, there you go. See, I mean, I look at that one and I had a completely different uh, uh, interpretation. Um, the story that comes up in my brain is that it almost looks like a volcanically created temple. It almost looks like it rose up from the lava if for me. So in that case, you see it coming down, I see it co going up. And it's just the beauty of, of, you know, applying your own logic and your own ideas to the painting, coming up with your own little story in your mind. It's, uh, it's incredible. That's, that's, that's pretty amazing. And I mean, I don't know, but most people will actually be uh, attracted to infernal style, uh, you know, paintings. I mean, have, are you familiar with uh, Wayne Barlow's Inferno? It sounds familiar. Yeah, from Morpheus International. I mean, Wayne Barlow has created this this book uh, a lot, sometime uh, almost twenty years ago or more, maybe thirty years ago. It was called Inferno. It was released by Morpheus International, and it's a series of landscapes from hell with the particular demons, barons, mm -hmm. dukes of hell. And then he wrote a couple of novels to tie all that stuff together, and uh, uh, it's such an amazing body of work. Uh, to this day, if you follow Wayne Barlow on Instagram, sometimes he will he will you know come up with like um, some images that he's sharing from uh, concepts that he did, and he's a great illustrator. But all of his paintings are like landscapes of hell, and in hell, every temple, every building was constructed by a brick made out of a soul. So all the bricks have eyes on them, and and that's basically so the more souls hell would receive the more bricks they would have and the bigger the temples would be. And it's just, it's crazy when you think about those things and how an artist can fish that idea from the big sea of ideas and just slap it onto a canvas and, uh, and, and just create an entire world like Clive Barker did with Aberrant and, and stuff like that. It's just so impressive when we get to, we used to transmit stories orally, and then we started printing them out uh, in, in pages and words. But now it's like these stories are conveyed through art. And uh, it's, it's just a, an amazing uh, immersion that we have when we look at all these volumes, you know, of the Imaginer books. It's just tremendous. One of the things that that's one of the things we, want, we, we wanted to capture in these pages is that, that visceral nature of these paintings the uh, the fact that these paintings have multiple mythologies, not just the ones that Clive intended for Abrad, but there it's infinite. Um, any one of us can apply infinite meaning to these, and uh, we, we wanted to we wanted to capture that in these pages. And you know, really, what well maybe pe maybe people listening to this don't know is that um, there was another very you know less exotic purpose for Imaginer. Um, Clive had no easy way to look at his own paintings. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he just had no easy way to go back and, and reference these works. Um, yeah, we had the, the, previous, the previous published volumes, but you know, part of the purpose for, for this archive was to give the artist, Clive, easy access to his own body of work, um, his, own, his own reference and his, his own easy access. And um, 
when I took, you know, rounds of proofs over to Clive to, to look at, um, you know, there was quite often that he would, he would see a painting in, in the pages of the proofs that he hadn't seen in years and that, and that maybe he forgot about until he got to see it again. And I think that's a really important call out to these books um, and, and a really important purpose of Imaginer. You know, it, it, it provides the artist a way to see his own work. And, you know, we kind of take that for granted. You know, like this painting here, this, this, this one was 60 by 72 inches tall. Um, it's called Beast Eats Beats Eats Beast. You know, it's a yeah. fun, um, you know, again, again, figurative. There's a theme here. I like the figurative works. Yeah. It's almost like um, a totem. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, there, there was just no easy way for Clive to, to, to remember this painting or to see it or to have mm -hmm. access to it yeah. before, before these books. So now, since we're talking about immersion, there's going to be a, a, a new book that's coming out from Phil and Sarah Stokes. It's cl called Clive Barker's Dark Worlds. And uh, it's going to be a deep dive into uh, the creative world and personal archive of Clive. And it's going to be profusely illustrated. So I'm, I'm, now I'm wondering if some of those um, scans that you did might end, up, might end up in this book. Do you know anything about that? Because it's going to have 300 color illustrations. There might be a chance that some of your scans are in there. I hope so. I uh, I don't know too much about that project, but uh, mm -hmm. if you know if, if it's something that Phil and Sarah mm -hmm. is behind, I'm sure it'll be wonderful. Um, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, it's coming out from Sir Nunos, and uh, it's a it's going to come out a couple of months from now, October 18, 2022. So, um, I'm sure this will have 300 illustrations. That's going to be something for people to add to their Imaginer uh, collection and just. Yeah. Uh, be able to find out more about the stories behind the paintings. Uh, that's going to be amazing. Definitely. That sounds cool. Yeah. So what are you doing now? You know, I've, um, I've, I was kind of, it's kind of funny, I've, you know, since I've been speaking to you, to you guys about this uh, podcast, um, I've been remembering my time with, with the Imaginer project and it really was very much, um, it, it was it was just indescribably wonderful to be a part of, and um, it was really, you know, it really marked sort of the culmination of of my Transmission Atelier project. Um, you know, like I said, I, I started Transmission Atelier in two thousand eight. It was a response to being really really burnt out and tired of because um, I was working in commercial advertising. I was working for Leo Burnett in Chicago, and uh, I was working on the Marlboro account. Um, we, you know, the Philip Morris tobacco account was at one time the largest print account in the world and it was sure. an entire industry and I was working on that account for a living and I was getting burnt out and I started Transmission Atelier. I wasn't totally clear on the direction it was supposed to go. I was just kind of letting it lead me around and Imaginer and, and my work with Clive was really the culmination of that project and you know once I completed design of all the books and once we completed pre-production and once I sent the last two, once I sent the files for the last two books for volume seven and eight um, to the printer. And then once I received the, the, the final printed samples back and completed my library, it was like, I could, I decided to kind of just conclude the project. Um, so Transmission Atelier is, is really now a project that has run its course. Um, it had this tremendous crescendo and this, and this really, really awesome climax with, with Clive. And it's, it's really sort of, I've, I've, sh I've shelved it now and I'm, I'm back in the straight world with this in, in the square community. And I, I'm, a, I'm an enterprise uh, systems architect and I'm, I'm back working for one of the largest uh, commercial printing companies uh, in the country uh, doing technology. Okay. And we print, uh, we print all kinds of things like um, we, we print Medicare statements, we print utility bills we print mail in ballots, um, big government institutional printing accounts, um, ah, okay. which are really the opposite in, in every way <laughs> as a project like this. <laughs> so, but they, they need to exist, now. right? They serve yeah. a practical and pragmatical function. So those yeah. things have to be made somehow. They have to be made. So now I'm, yeah. I'm really sort of like on the exact opposite hemisphere as, as where a project like this would come from. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing today. Well, and that's kind of where it's supposed to be. Um, like I said, this was this was such a, a defining project. Um, it was literally a passion project. I was thinking about this the other day. It was, you know, I forgot that you know this was before 
a, a paid freelance project, which is really by definition wasn't what it was. It was a passion project. And it was pure love and pure passion that went into this. And it's really, really rare that all of the conditions line up to be able to have a project like this come to existence. I mean, you know, there's economic factors and there's logistic factors and there's legal factors, but the fact that this project um, was able to come to existence and the fact that we were able to all pour our hearts passion into it, I think is what made it ultimately successful. And again, that's really a nod to Phil and Sarah for, for providing a container and, and space for this project to happen. Well, and, and the, one thing, one thing that we didn't, uh, we didn't mention earlier is that uh, the, the real Clive Barker website, you were providing the scans and the prints that were for sale on that site at the time that that was, uh, that that was up and running. Yeah. So, yeah, I forgot that too. So Transmission Atelier was really, my, my original idea for Transmission Atelier was, was to be an art publishing entity. And I really loved Back then, I was I was really 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 enamored of edition prints. I have more edition prints than I do original paintings. I just love I love high quality edition prints. I love signed edition prints, and I love it. I love originals too. But you know, I, I think collecting edition prints allows me to marry my my life profession, my my career, my life's work into a fine art domain. So I love edition prints. Mm -hmm. And Transmission Atelier was always meant to be a print publisher. Um, this is before a lot of the artists today, you know, found they could make their own prints and, 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 and produce their own prints. And G, um, please. Yeah, and that <laughs> whole thing. And, uh, you know, Transmission Atelier was always meant to be a third party art publishing entity um, and to make prints. So I got to make all the uh, really high end edition prints for Clive. And uh, they were, G, Clay is one way to describe them. Um, a more applicable term is pisiography. Um, mm. the, the process is really better known as piezography, mm -hmm. meaning, you know, you're using, um, you're using a piezographic transfer process to spray ink onto high quality substrates using really, really high end color corrected, sharp digital images. So I was making addition prints too, uh, in Clive's house. So that was really, really cool because I had the original paintings. Mm -hmm. I had the ability to scan all the original paintings. And then I was doing proper proofing and color matching and color validation on site in the same room where the paintings were created. And then Clive would okay them. And then he would sign and number them and they would go up on the website for sale. And I just love the continuity of that. Um, to be able to, to produce um, edition prints inside the space where the originals existed and where they're created. And then to have the artist, you know, next door where we could collaborate together mm -hmm. makes it just so, so special. It, it, it made those prints more, more special than I think people understand. It wasn't just a product that we we're churning out. <laughs> right. Um, they were made professionally. Yeah. You know, one of the things that's really frustrating to me is, you know, I, I love that artists can publish their own prints, but man, I'll tell you, it's, it's so hard to, to collect prints from from a lot of these artists because the prints aren't very good <laughs> and they they don't look like the originals the color doesn't match um i know a lot of artists capture their prints with a dslr camera right which means you can't make enlargements which means that you're not uh, capturing all the detail and the nuance and the brush strokes so these yeah. these things that you know you see today are they're representational products they're they're iterations of the original and i like i like the true archival derivative the archival document yeah mm -hmm. i mean each each imaginer came with its own little limited print um accompanying it i framed some of those they're actually i'm in the process of moving to cleveland uh, at the end of the month so that stuff is already um wrapped in bubble wrap and stuff but i framed some of those and they were beautiful prints that came with each edition of imaginer uh, usually from a painting from inside the book i remember seeing the big printer there uh, I think at the time, on the day that we were visiting, there were some proofs for some of the midnight meat train paintings that Clive had done with like, um, you know, some of those monsters that he had created for that. I remember seeing some of those on top of the printer. So uh, an impressive device for sure. Uh, very, very cool. 
Yeah, it was, um, I mean, it's not that the printer I was using was anything special. I mean, it was a very high end device. It was a 12 color device that had a gloss enhancer head inside of it. And a lot of the printers now are, are eight to 10 colors. This was a 12 color device. It allowed us, and it had a really high, what's called nozzle count, which, which really translates to, you know, you had more ink nozzles spraying ink on the paper, which allowed you to achieve a higher effective image, re image resolution. And yeah, so you saw some of the, I did a lot of proofing. Sometimes I, I just, I did proofing because I felt like it. I would come into work and I, I would need to get that inspiration. I would just proof something. And it was kind of funny. This turned into a, a little mini routine that I had with Clive where I would, I would pick some paintings I thought were cool. And I would just start making proofs of them. And I would just, uh, you know, sometimes I would just pick a painting and, and, and make an exacting copy, a, a, a edition print copy of that painting, like indistinguishable in color and detail from the painting. And I would take that over to Clive next door and he would just be astonished. He would just get so excited um, seeing his work translated that way. And he, he would remember too, if I, if I didn't get the color exactly right, he would remember. Mm -hmm. um, I think he had like a photographic memory when it comes to that stuff. So this is one of those that we did. This painting called um, Axis Christ Condition. Mm -hmm. This was hanging in his in his room in his in his living room uh, uh, next door, and that's where he was kind of living at the time. So this was I literally took this off the wall because I thought it was cool. I'm like, hey, Clive, can I have that? He's like, oh, sure. So I would I would go next door and I would digitize it, and then if I felt like I would make I would make proofs and I would I would walk him over there and then show it to him and we would nerd out together on, on the color quality. And it was just a lot of fun. You know, it was kind of a fun part of this that, that I incorporated yeah. into it. It's funny that you mentioned, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this story, if it's real or not, but I remember uh, one time near the end of his career, Dolly had a bunch of prints made out of his works. And uh, some, some person asked him, what did he think about people who buy reproductions of his works? At, at some point, I think he would just sign a bunch of blank papers and they would just print the, uh, prints of his, you know, religious uh, period paintings. And he said something was like, well, if these people want to print my images and, and those people want to buy them from them, I think they deserve each other. <laughs> that was what oh, Salvador geez. Dali said. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he, he thought of that in a high regard for the particular quality that they were doing, but uh, I yeah, understand that. that. Kind of, yeah. I, I understand. I understand that, uh, you know, the, the, the common consensus, I believe, um, I may be wrong, but the common consensus I believe of, around edition prints is, is that they're really they're really merchandise. Um, mm -hmm. You can make the argument all day long that that edition prints are not a an artifact, uh, you know, a fine art object mm -hmm. that has mm -hmm. intrinsic value, or or the potential to appreciate in value. I, I just want to clarify that those prints of Dolly's work were actually considered to be not very good. That's why he said that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, yeah, I think yeah, I'm familiar yeah. with that series. I, I, yeah. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Sears sold those for a while in the 60s. Oh, sure, wasn't there like <laughs> yeah. Vincent Price was- Yeah, the, uh, for the Vincent Price collection. Hand curating yeah. like some, yeah, absolutely. Oh, That's man. kind of funny, Vincent Price is a role model of mine and uh, I have his cookbook. And <laughs> um, I, I know that he was a, a very prolific um, collector and he was a legitimate collector. He, he, he was very, very educated about what he would collect. and. I used to have this joke where, you know, when I started Transmission Atelier, I'm like, why am I doing this again? I'm like, oh, because I want to be the Vincent Price of the art world, you know, <laughs> but that job was already taken. Yeah. Um, On our next episode that we're going to be putting up tomorrow, uh, Jose and I do some bad impressions of, of Vincent Price. Excellent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, the yeah. edition prints for Clive, that was really about the continuity of presence. You know, it was, it was a mm -hmm. once in a lifetime opportunity for an imaging lab to be set up for a really high-end imaging lab to exist in the artist's studio where he created the paintings that are still sitting there and having the artist right next door. So it, yeah. it was the continuity of those things that made it really incredibly unique and special. And the fact that we were able to make um, really a superior quality edition print. And there's a little, there was a little endorsement that Clive wrote about, about the prints I made for him that I think used to exist on that website. Um, but it was also great to, to, uh, to see how much he, he liked them and how, how, um, how, how he appreciated the quality. Cause again, he's, he's an experienced publishing guy. You know, he's got a long history in publishing. He understands the process. 
Well, and you're 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 doing you're doing a, a massive service to the to the the fans because otherwise not everybody can buy Christopher Carrion, right? I mean, but but if you if you have a print, then you have something more affordable that's available to everybody. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And that was that was a that was a good benefit as well. I, I can't afford Christopher Carrion either. And you know what? <laughs> I've got a few Clyde Barker prints. Um and Christopher Carrion, for some reason, I don't have a print of Christopher Carrion. And that was that was one of the ones that was on the website, I believe. For some reason, I never got mm. a Christopher Carrion print. And I wonder if I could, uh, if Phil and Sarah are listening, yeah. maybe I could ask them to fix that for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, you know, another yes. thing too about edition prints, another practical thing about edition prints that, that it's easy to forget about is Clive Barker's paintings are mostly 40 inches by... 40 by 60 and some are 72 inches tall some of mm -hmm. his paintings are triptychs and they're over yeah. 120 inches wide and these are not you know apartment size paintings and the addition print is also a great way to to get a more um useful size of an artwork yeah exactly Log I mean, logistically they make more sense yes <laughs> yeah exactly it's hard to ship yeah. a uh, a full-size five Barker painting that's for sure yeah, I I think now that you mentioned the size of the paintings, it's it's one of the things that I saw once I, I was lucky enough to see a Francis Bacon retrospective that had like 40 paintings and they are all gigantic. I don't know if you ever saw a Francis Bacon painting, but um, they're gigantic. They're they're enormous. They're like five foot tall. And, you know, it, it's uh, and that vibrant orange that he liked to use. It's just when you see it, I had a, a cheap art book that had like, you know, postage size stamp, you know, images of what the paintings look like sometimes. And it's like, oh, look at that. That's a triptych. But then when you see the triptych properly lighted, properly mounted in a, in a, in a good space with good lighting, it's a, it's, it's, there's no comparison. There really is no comparison. Mm. There is no yeah. comparison either. I, I, yeah. I would agree. And that, that actually reminds me, I'm, I'm trying to look for um, one of the triptychs that's in Imaginer volume. Mm -hmm. When do we start doing trip doing doing gatefolds? Oh, I think it was oh. volume six. Yeah, six and seven. I think were big ones for that. So, um, it was it was Phil and Sarah's idea to start introducing the concept of gatefolds into these later volumes because um, we were really kind of struggling to to figure out how we would present some of Clive's triptychs. Yeah. and yeah, you don't um, want to turn the page in in the middle of it. Yeah, so gatefolds yeah. was really the only way to do it, and um, these gatefolds, I think I was talking to Stephen Joff at the printer of the Global PSD, and these were probably some of the largest gatefolds in any art book, aside yeah. from maybe those sumo editions. So like here is of Abrad um, three. Yeah. 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 So that's that's the Mater Motley. I, I believe Phil mm -hmm. and Sarah own this this painting. It's in their it's in oh, their wow. house. Nice. Amazing. They actually uh they actually um had to send me. So Phil and Sarah actually took this detail shot. They climbed up on oh. top of a ladder and, and took this shot and, and sent it to me because um, this was uh, this painting is in, is in England, but we want to put it in the book. So that's one of the kind of fun things that went into the production. Wow. But I was, I was looking for another specific painting. It was another triptych. Um, bear with me one second. Yeah, take your time. It was a, so there was a do you, I don't know if you guys remember the it was like it was like a lounge in the Seraphim house. It was where there was a couch and that really, really grotesque sculpture of uh, of all the masks that were melted together was in there. Right, yeah. right. Uh, yeah. So I we know the uh, one you're talking about. So I quite often, you know, we, we would we would redecorate that room. We would rotate yeah. out the paintings. It, it, that, that that room became like a. Uh, a gallery for Clive's art. When and I was there, they had Princess Breath and they had that Proteus kind of a- uh, Yeah, the Proteus know. thing. Yeah. The yeah. One of my all time favorite objects. Yeah. So and this trip, this triptych was in there. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yeah. So- That ended up in a book cover for an anthology called Horrorology. Yeah. Yeah. So this it's, was, um, this was called uh, Babylonium After Midnight. And this was hanging in that office for a long time. And 
you know, you were talking about the the impact of a full size painting over an edition print, and that's that's what I wanted to agree with you on. Oh, I man. would I would so often go and sit on the couch and just stare at that at that triptych, and it was so visceral. I mean, you could never be finished looking at that painting. Every time you look at it, you see something else, right? You, you could never every be square inch as a deliberate. Uh, part of that organic mass of of demons or whatever they're supposed to be it's like it's incredible there was no and, empty space there that isn't taken up by some sort of uh body part no and and the color palette in this painting was absolutely delicious i mean this was clive really really um going crazy with color and that was his thing is he's yeah. a lover of color and I don't think there's there's too many other paintings of his that, that exemplify that. Um, this was a color palette that looked edible. You know, uh, it, it, yeah. it looked like like I would want to make a dessert out of these colors. And <laughs> yes. it was just it was so. I spent endless amounts of hours staring at this painting. That is so cool. Make it out of truffles. I I'll, I'll eat it. <laughs> you know, there's a there's a YouTube video out there. I think it's out there still of Clive painting a triptych in his studio. And we wanted to include that triptych in Imaginer. Mm -hmm. And it's another Babylonium. So that was Babylonium after midnight. And this is the companion triptych called Babylonium. Which is a daytime oh, yeah. version. Yeah. 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 So this was, if you go and search YouTube and, and look for Clive Barker painting, he's actually um, being interviewed while he's painting this work. So oh, okay. again, it's that, it's that continuity. So the painting was created in that studio space. That's where the imaging lab was. The painting was still in that room and the Imaginer books were being designed and, and produced in that same space. And um, now they're, they're in this book. So it's that continuity that I love so much about this project. Yeah. Um, in terms of scale, I think one of the largest paintings that Clive has done, which is probably just as big as the the islands of the Aberat trip. The, uh, it's not a triptych. It's four a, canvases, a, right? A beautiful moment. A beautiful moment yeah. was light wisdom and sound that he did back in the '90s at a New York nightclub, and uh, they recently found that painting rolled up somewhere. Light wisdom and sound. So I, I, I remember about seeing, that. I remember seeing it. Um, yeah, it was it was rolled up in a space in Clive's house called Studio B. Right. And it was, and, um, unfortunately, so we, we were trying to, we, we made several attempts to figure out how we could scan that painting. Mm -hmm. And we just couldn't figure out how to do it because um, we couldn't unroll the painting. We could barely fit the painting. We could unroll it. So, right. so you could see the whole thing in Studio A. But there was no way I could um, align the camera. Yeah. To the, in front of that painting inside that space. And it was really, really unfortunate. Uh, I'm familiar with that painting. It does exist. The only way I could have shot that painting is if we rented a truck and maybe a big tent and rented some outdoor space somewhere and set it up on like a big easel and, and shot it outside. And there just wasn't, unfortunately, there just, there just wasn't the time to, to capture that one, but that does exist, that one. It was 10 feet by 20 feet long. It, it's, yeah incredible so i actually sent a link from my article we have a few pictures of people who were at the event and uh, they were able to take some pictures in front of the uh, painting so those are probably the only pictures that i could see that encompass the entire painting um and uh it's incredible i uh, i just think that making something of that scale is just a monumental effort it's just so amazing absolutely yeah, which 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 brings to us back around to the topic of I still don't know how, you know, one person managed to generate all those paintings. Uh, <laughs> I did some math. It was like if if you take this if you take this many paintings that were forty eight by sixty inches tall, that's a finite amount of surface that you have to cover, with you know very detailed, very specific, intentional works of art. I just don't know how it was possible. I mean, I don't. Clive probably wasn't sleeping a whole lot in the 1990s. Yeah. I don't know, yeah. but definitely not. Um, anyway, so 
this is great. I, I got a I got a lot of this that I had no idea, and and it was great talking to you, uh, Ian. Yeah. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask? You've been very quiet. Yeah, uh, you guys talk a lot. <laughs> we do. This is cool, um, James. I know that uh, you felt that um, Imaginer Volume Three was the most perfect of the series, and you curated it based on how you felt internally with uh, the most figure. Uh, figurative paintings and grotesque beasts and monsters. Could you could you say a little more about that? Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks Ian for that question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily, in the, I'm, not, I'm not saying really that Imaginer 3 was the best, but it's certainly my favorite for, for many, many different reasons. The first of which being, like I said, Ima Imaginer Volume 3 was, was made and, and produced entirely on site um, in Clive's studio. I mean, that was the one and only time where we had the paintings, the studio space, the imaging lab, and the design process for the books and the approval process for the books all happening in the same space. And volume three came about when we, um, a, a lot of Clive's paintings were, were in a storage facility because there was a flood in the house. And we managed to get those paintings out of storage and a lot of them. And we, they were all wrapped in bubble wrap we put them down in the studio house, unpackaged them. And a lot of these paintings, I don't think were ever seen by anybody. So I had found myself now living and working in this studio space with all of these paintings now just surrounding me. And, you know, I just sort of begun to resonate with the ones that were my favorite at the time. And the ones that were my favorite at the time were, were figurative paintings. They were paintings of, of monsters, you know, like this one. Yeah. And, I just kind of resonated with, with a lot of the subject matter because they aligned with some stuff I was going through at the time personally. Um, I found great solace in, in, in being able to look at these paintings. I found uh, almost, a, uh, almost a, a healing process for some personal things I was going through through these paintings. And I, I had spent you know months and months and months essentially staring at them and living with them. And I was able to study them more than anybody should study paintings. I was able to really study them and research them. And they sort of presented themselves in the order that you see in Imaginer Volume 3. So the way Volume 3 was curated and assembled, it was really, really a, a, a very, very holistic process. And that's really why it was my favorite. Um, it's the volume that, that I'm most personally attached to. Um, Phil and Sarah, um, were gracious enough to provide me with a lot of uh, sort of curatorial freedom for this volume. And uh, I think I was able to put my heart and soul into it. And I was also collaborating with Clive very closely on it. And that was special too. You know, Clive um, really, really uh, came to like all the choices that I made. And that meant a lot. Um, so I hope that answers your question. You know, like, this is this is a painting too. I, I don't know that, that that many people have seen this painting. Um, this is this is an example of volume three. Oh, it's called uh, "Leading the, the Way." Uh, oh, okay. And so, is... so a lot of the paintings in volume three were, you know, I should mention there was a there was a couple paintings that I did see somewhere, you know, years before printed somewhere like like this one, which is the lovers. And then there was a companion one, the alchemical twins. I had seen a transparency of this one mm. and I thought the painting was long gone. And then we got the painting out of storage and, and, and then I had it and it was very exciting, you know, to, to include this one. That's a really impressive one. And I particularly like the idea that they had to, from volume one, I don't know who came up with that idea, but from volume one through volume eight, all the page numbers are continuous. <laughs> so it really makes it like, a continuous experience from book to book. Yeah, it's, it's got that encyclopedic um, aspect to it. You know, mm -hmm. if you think mm -hmm. about it, you know, I think of Imaginer as a 1664 page art monograph in, in two versions of eight volumes, you know, the, the standard edition and the clamshell uh, box edition. So I think that was a great uh, encyclopedic feature. These boxes are tremendous. Like yeah, you, they're pretty substantial, drop, right? You drop someone this on someone's head, you're gonna kill them. 
That is an amazing, <laughs> like deluxe edition. And, you know, some yeah. of them are still available, but uh, these things are incredible. Like so sturdy. This, this is just an absolute delight to hold one of these. Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's Stephen, that's Stephen Joff at Global PSD that, mm -hmm. uh, that really did a great job engineering those, those clamshell boxes. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of engineering involved in those. We had to make sure that the, uh, so what, one of the things that, you know, kind of a boring detail is, you know, we had to make sure that all of the, all the spines were the same size across the volumes. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure in order to achieve that, oh, we right. had to make sure that all the page counts were the same. And when we got into doing gatefolds, um, the math was kind of complex. We had to, we had to offer gatefolds, but keep the physical page count the same as not to expand the spine size mm -hmm. to change the size of the boxes because the end goal was to have these things all on a shelf and be completely uniform. You know, so there's the obsessive bibliophile aspect that went into this. Um, you know, and, and and the graphics in the spine had to all line up. And, you know, we're, we're spelling the word imaginer on the spines that was engineered. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, there's not much of that done anymore where we have these, these matching, these, these continuous spinal treatments. Right, and, right. And, yeah. and, and the continuity of, of, of spine sizes and, and, and sizes of the book. And, you know, we made sure that, you know, the, 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 the coating on, the, on the, the, the covers is a, is a soft touch matte lamination. Mm -hmm. And we made sure that, that we're using the same chemical pound, compound, the same batch every, with every volume. Oh, and wow. yeah, so there was a lot of that sort of um, uh, attention to continuity that was uh, exhaustive. And I think I think we I think we nailed it, and that's that's really Stephen at, at Global PSD. The choice for the eighth volume to have the number eight across the uh, in the deluxe edition to have the number eight across the 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 cover, almost like a painted number eight, and it almost it's so skewed that it almost looks like this is the last volume that represents infinity. It's like it it it, it there you go. Your brain just starts making those those ideas in you when you look at the good good typography good binding kind of really is a pleasure to hold and uh and to to look through it's really good you know uh, james there is, there is um, oh, go ahead, Ian. okay i was gonna say there was almost a volume or two uh added to it that we almost that we didn't see am i correct yeah so that there was a i was just going to talk about some of the outtakes um there was talk and there, there was a concept that was being thrown around to do these eight volumes of, of paintings. And then there was talk and there was some, there was exploration around doing two additional volumes of uh, pen and ink drawings mm -hmm. and works on paper. And I think if I remember correctly, we were, we were trying to figure, we were trying to design a, an all white volume, which is gonna be sort of drawings and sketches. And it would oh. it would have been uh, it would have been an all white spine and, and case cover, and then there was there was going to be a red volume that I believe was going to be paintings on paper, but um, we never uh, we never were able to execute that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe in the future, I don't know. Maybe Phil and Sarah might pick that up, but uh, that's that was a concept that we were going over. Phil and Sarah, if you're hearing, if you're listening yeah. to this, please. <laughs> Let's get that white and, 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 and red volume done because yeah. that sounds like a tremendous idea and a great addition to the Imaginer. Because I, I've always enjoyed uh, Clive's Sumi ink drawings and, uh, and, and it's just it's just a variety of creatures that he would come up with, just the little doodles that I have a couple of them. Um, and I, I look at those on, the, on my wall and I still can't believe that, uh, that I own them. It's just a, such an amazing, amazing thing to say, hey, this was published and I have it right here. And this is the original. I, I collect comic book art, original comic book art. I've, I have a few dozen pages of comic book art and I have some John Bolton and, uh, and uh, yeah. So it's really amazing to see sometimes from painting to, or, or for completed artwork to published artwork, how the, like you said, how the color can change and, and not just that, like what, what gets cut out, what gets cropped out. And, uh, and then you feel like you, you went through the page and there it is, this is what the artist created. And now this cover has text all over it, but now you have the actual original one, which is amazing. 
that's funny. I, one of my early, one of my jobs early in my career is I worked for a, uh, back in the nineties, we called these places service bureaus. Um, they were, they were desktop publishing facilities that would do digital imaging and, and pre-press as a service. And I worked for a company in Chicago that had Marvel and DC as a, as a, as a customer. And we were doing the earliest digital coloring for comic books. And we did, we did a lot of, we called it cut color. And we were using a system called Cod Barrett, which is a DOS-based tool that was designed to color comic book pages. And um, it was before Photoshop was viable. And I would do the separations and the film stripping. They called it film stripping back then for, for comic book covers. And I have, um, the company went out of business, unfortunately, filed bankruptcy. And I, I rescued from the dumpster when they came in to liquidate everything from this company, I rescued three or four giant tubs full of production material for comics, all these photo stats yeah. and color proofs uh -huh. and color keys and just hundreds and hundreds of, of things. I haven't gone through it since I grabbed the stuff in the nineties. It's sitting in my basement. Yeah. Um, you know, we had, we had, uh, I think, you know, we, we were, we were the shop that colored, Sandman, the original Sandman comic. Oh, oh no way! I just wow. saw the Netflix uh, show that uh, yeah. just premiered this week. It's amazing. We colored uh, the Invisibles mm -hmm. um, when that came out. Uh, Preacher. I remember. I remember. I, I think I have a. I think I have a, a color, a set of color copies of the color guides for Preacher number one. Wow. Um, so we we colored Preacher too. So this is a very early digital color stuff. So you mm -hmm. mentioned comic books. I've got a. I've got a fondness for comics too. So does Clive. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Dave McKean's covers on the Vertigo editions of Sandman, uh, it completely revolutionized comic book covers. I mean, at the time they were just like, they were just the same art that used to be on the inside. And it was just like the, the dynamic pose, Marvel pose or whatever. But then you started seeing these mixed media like uh, reproductions on the covers of Sandman with Dave McKean art. And you're like, wow, this is, I've never seen a comic book that looks like this. And uh, it really revolutionized cover art, I think. I, uh, I particularly enjoy Dave McKean's art very much. I do too. I, I was lucky enough to do some edition prints for Dave McKean um, when I first started Transmission Atelier. And uh, super, super nice guy. Um, and I, I'm a big fan of his artwork. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny. When, when I was, another, another comic I worked on, the production for, was Ecto Kid. Oh, and yeah. I, oh, yeah. And I remember, I remember getting this job and I remember, I remember, starting working at this company it was like in 94 and i remember seeing some of the clive comics come through like we we did the production work and the separations for pinhead and we did um some of the production work for ecto kid and huh. i remember thinking i'm like clive barker that's the hellraiser guy yeah uh -huh, he's yeah. doing comics now cool <laughs> but i actually have i think in my basement i've got the original film workups that made the plates for ecto uh -huh. kid wow. which is a weird Clive Barker synchronicity. Um, yeah. Not the only one of those. I, I yeah, I, I met uh, Steve Scrose, the uh, the artist for Ecto Kid back in 93, I believe. And he he did me, he made me a sketch of like Ecto Kid. So I still have that sign. I had like a color separation from Pinhead versus Martial Law, Law in Hell by <laughs> yeah. Kevin O'Neill. And uh, it's, it's a photocopy of the original art that the artist would paint and place the all the color codes that are supposed to go in there. So yeah. I do have a few of those things. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see. It's like peeking behind the curtain, right? You're looking at how they do it. And then that, it's very, very interesting. Yeah. It was awesome. I remember, I remember, you know, working really late at night, getting these, uh, getting these film separations done, sending them off to, to the printer to meet the deadline. And then going down to the newsstand, you know, a couple of weeks later to buy the comics. It was a, uh, something that only a true publishing nerd would be into <laughs> yeah and collecting ash can editions and stuff like that totally uh, yeah well this is great i mean uh brian and ian do you guys have any more questions um i james speaking of hellraiser i i understand you uh gained an opportunity to become friendly with ashley lawrence and hang out with her a little bit um ashley lawrence uh, i met her i met her once um, her and her fiance or boyfriend, I'm not sure which, came over to, uh, to Seraphim one evening and uh, they hung out with us and uh, 
she's delightful. She's totally cool. And she, you know what? I remember now she actually, she's, she's good friends with Clive still. And I think she, if my memory serves, she came over to borrow one of Clive's easels. Cause I, I think she was, she was, uh, she's she was a painter, painter herself. Yeah. 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 So she literally came over to, it was kind of funny. It's like Ashley Lawrence is coming over to borrow one of Clive's easels, you know, and <laughs> she hung out with us and she was totally cool. And she, um, you know, she was one of the ones that, uh, I'm sure I won't get in trouble for divulging this, but you know, she like, like so many other people, you know, got pretty emotional when she was in the studio, when she was in Clive's studio. And I, I, I saw that so often where people would just get overwhelmed and that happened to her. Yeah. And uh, we had a great conversation with her. She's totally cool. Um, so yeah, that was, that was another kind of fun sort of little highlight, you know? That's awesome. That's so neat. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much for, for joining us for this. We really had a, a blast hearing about all the technical stuff and, and, and finding out a little more about, you know, James K and your Transmission Atelier and all the work you did for the Imaginer books, which are an amazing, you know, an amazing part of any Clyde Barker fans collection. And uh, really appreciate the time you spent with us. And uh, Oh, thanks for having me. And Ian, thanks yeah. so much for reaching out and, uh, and for all your time. Yeah. Uh, hashing this out and thank you very much it was, it was a pleasure and an honor yeah, yeah thank, thank you so you. much ian and, and yeah thank okay. you great job guys yeah. um yeah so uh if you ever get into anything uh that's going to be an interesting project give us a, a holler and we'll uh we'll post about it on our blog okay yeah definitely thanks so much for um for taking the time and having me on guys much appreciated awesome wonderful yeah, thank you now I got to drive over to Cleveland to look at houses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Good luck. I hope you find a good one. Have a great night. Have a great weekend. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone, Thank guys. You. Keep in touch if you want, mm -hmm. guys. Sure. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. And this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have subscribed. You can find the Clive Barker podcast wherever you find audio. Show notes for this episode, as well as news and reviews, can be found at our website at www.clivebarkercast.com. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Watch for our annual Kickstarter fundraisers to get some cool stuff, and you can buy t-shirts on our TeePublic store. Go to TeePublic.com and search for BarkerCast. Thanks for listening.